It is my pleasure and honor to see you and to talk to you a little bit about what I have experienced here, what I have done for our fellow citizens. And it's a long story. It took me uh, about 55 years, and I have to summarize it maybe in 55 minutes or less. So it's not a very easy job. However, I have been having the permission of Dr. Kukuzela to speak about my subject because he's the chairman of the historical society and I'm a mem member of that society and I made a comment or a request a few years ago and I said that in order to have the historical background about we the physicians in the medical society, each specialty and subspecialty should be having some records of what they have done or what they are doing. And I said I volunteer that I will do that for my area of work. So that's my presentation today about the forensic pathology and anything related to that. Dr. Fiss, as you noted, he presented his talk. He told me already that he doesn't like my talk, so he wanted to give, your, to give you the uh, presentation from the uh, medical society, and he would leave, and he left. You noted that. So with your permission, I'm going to start, and hopefully I know how to operate this. Because in the old days, we had 35 millimeter slides, a carousel. It was very easy to do this and that. Now the technologies, I'm not very much familiar. So I apologize if I say or do something that doesn't look too good. So with that background, you noted that the topic of my presentation is the background about medical examiner system here and the forensic sciences laboratory. Now, let me just, somebody said, who's going to introduce you? And I said, well, with the permission of my colleagues, I introduce myself because I know myself better than anyone else. <laughs> so I was born and raised in the northern part of the city of Rasht in Iran. It used to call it Iran, but it's not Iran, it's Iran. And this city of Rasht was in the northern part of the country. When I was a little child, and that was the era of Second World War, the Russians invaded the northern part of Iran. And my grandfather, my the father of my mother had a well-to-do uh, rice company. They came and put a gun on his chest and said, open the door, we're going to take all your rice. So they took everything and the family became poor and they moved to Tehran, which is the capital of Iran. And I was raised over there, had all my education. Just happened, I didn't do anything, but just happened that I had very good scholastic records. So I didn't have to pay for anything for my education. And in fact, uh, throughout my high school and, and the uh, medical school, I paid absolutely nothing. And because of that, I could have stayed in Tehran and have my own practice there. The law was that we had to leave after the graduation to go to other cities because we had shortage of physicians. But they permitted, they did, the permit, they did permit me to stay Tehran because of my record. 
However, I said, no, I insist to go. And I went to some villages and practiced there because I felt that they needed more. While I was there, I decided to continue my medical education in the field that I wanted. And there was a question to go to France, to go to England, or to come to the United States. The United States had a very, very famous board and reputation at that time, within the Second World War and everything. So I decided to come here. So I went to the American Embassy and submitted my request how to get in touch with various hospitals here. I had several acceptances from various universities and hospitals. And one of them was from Baltimore. And that hospital was associated with the University of Maryland Hospital and very, had a very nice picture of the building and next to ocean. And I always liked ocean and so uh, among all those universities I selected Lutheran Hospital of Baltimore associated with the University of Maryland and uh, so I came to the United States. I came by boat. And that was a very nice boat. Four and a half days to get to New York from France to New York City. I didn't speak English because I studied Fran French. And I knew only a few words. The uh, immigration officer, once I got out of the boat, said, and I had only, by, because when I was practicing for two years over there, I really didn't need the money. The, those villagers needed more the money. So when I came here, I only had $100. And the exchange at that time was very good. Seven tuman was $1. Last night I checked 14,000 tuman is $1. So. Uh, I was able to come with $100 here, and uh, I went to uh, to one of these hotels over there, and in two days I was on. At that time, they had Greyhound buses. I don't know whether they, they are not as famous right now, but it was a very good transportation situation. And I came to Delaware. I took a taxi cab, as the immigration officer told me, and I showed that paper, and I said, I'm going to go to Lutheran Hospital. Incidentally, when I went to get the ticket at the Greyhound bus station in New York, I said, I took my suitcase, and it was a long way to go to the area to get the ticket, and I left my suitcase over there and walked back there and when I got back the suitcase was there nobody took it it was beautiful so I said this is the country that I want <laughs> so nice and I was in line and I said I want to go to Lutheran Hospital because I didn't know how to pronounce because you were some of the syllables you don't use sometimes and the man said what and I repeated and again said, what? And then finally, after the third time, the gentleman behind me said, you want to go to Luton Hospital? You know, he said very fast, Baltimore. I said, Baltimore. He said, no, Baltimore. <laughs> so he gave me the ticket and came to Baltimore. I took a taxi cab and showed the picture. And he took me after running some miles he stopped in front of a dilapidated building. He said, get out. Uh, I said, no. This hospital, ocean. He said, get out. He took my suitcase from the trunk of the car, his car and his taxi cab. And he said, this is the one. I said, 
So he said, come on over here. Took the picture. There was a little notice at the bottom of the corner, proposed hospital. And I didn't know what was the meaning of proposed. I saw that I was going near the ocean, beautiful hospital, beautiful building. In any event, I started my work over there as an intern. We had to have a second internship. I had an internship in Iran, and then I had my second internship, which then we had to, as a foreign graduate, we had to have, take it, an examination in order to to be qualified to practice here in the United States. So I went through all those things. All my life, my mother was always sick. I want to be a doctor to treat her. I didn't know that you could You couldn't treat your own mom, your own family. But as a child, I thought that that was. And then always I wanted to do something about justice, because no justice happened to our family. And I wanted to always do something. And when I put the things together, I thought the field of pathology and forensic pathology is a good field that I can work for justice. And that was my mission when I started the field of pathology, first at the University of Maryland. Then I went to the University of Alabama in Birmingham, Alabama, a very nice place at that time. It was so nice that you left your house, you never locked your door over there. You go on for two, three hours, bought everything, go back. Nobody was in your house. It was your house, period. You never locked your car door. You remember those days? I'm sure some of you, most of you are much younger to remember those days. But then they had those steering wheel. None of these things. At that time, you left your car and you just did your work, went back there. Your car was still there. <laughs> Isn't that a good day? Yeah, nice. In any event, I, I was there. One thing I noticed, there was a big dining room for the staff at the hospital. And then there was another room, a smaller one, for physicians. And then there was a closet for black physicians. And I remember that very well. It was 60 years ago. And, but in any event, very nice place. I had my training. My professor at that time, Dr. Charles Lupton, he was very kind to me. And finally, I came back to Delaware, I mean, to Baltimore, finished my training in pathology and forensic pathology. And always I was interested in neurological problems. So I, was, I had interest in forensic neuropathology. And I finished my training. And there was a hospital in the southern part of the state uh, called Southern Baltimore Hospital, something like that. Now is a big medical center. At that time, it was a small one. And there were very few pathologists in this country at that time. Radiologists, pathologists, even anesthesiologists, there were not too many of them. So they would give you a very good compensation for your work. That hospital offered me $80,000 because as a pathologist, director of the laboratory, you can get extra money too, a certain percentage. But I heard that there was a position available here in Delaware for medical examiner. So I said, this is the one that I want. And I applied for it in April 1964. There was a setup here called Board of Postmortem Examiner. Maybe you heard about it, maybe you haven't heard. But that board, at that time, this goes back to uh, 55 years ago. In Delaware, we didn't have a cabinet form of government. We had boards, uh, commission, or something like that, and then we had the governor. So this board of 
or postmortem examiner consisted of a president or head of the commission who was the attorney general of the state and then there were three representatives physicians one from each counties we had the three counties here and also we had something that was very interesting to me three coroners and each one of them was at that time they used to call them undertakers or mortician or whatever and they were members and they were elected they were elected by people to be a coroner and they were members of the board they offered me first sixteen thousand dollars and when they looked at the, my background they said well you're worth for eighteen thousand so they gave me eighteen thousand they offered eighteen thousand the budget of the office of the medical examiner was thirty five thousand it was increased in two years to sixty five thousand and guess what another member of that board was the uh, auditor general of the state so we needed someone to check the budget of that big organization isn't it sixty five thousand dollars you have to audit that so that's how i started so here are the coroners and let me show you if i can operate this it doesn't work. So <clears throat> I come here and there is the first article incident. The, I was on my way here July 1st, the car coming from Baltimore and uh, I heard news on the radio WDEL announcing today our chief medical examiner Alai Z. Hamalai is coming <laughs> and at that time if you remember there was only one big building in downtown so I was driving toward the city there was only one building and came here you see here the announcement and I didn't look that bad you know uh, that picture was is a copy so it doesn't look too good so uh, if you go back a little bit you will see that you know when I finished the medical school I didn't I looked a little bit better <laughs> so that's how I started and here's the news don't we need don't we have even one American pathologist to take the job and here this fellow comes from overseas guess what the establishment of medical examiner system by a law in the state of Delaware was 1955 and since 1955 to 1964 there were three medical examiners none of them being American born to begin with one of them only lasted for less than two years one of them lasted for less than one year in the job because it was almost impossible later on I found out and one of them for three months and even didn't show up so I was the fourth one and here I come to take the job and this was my office in the funeral home 819 Washington Street Yatemans funeral home and there were steps going down on top of the step there was a desk and that was coroner's desk coroner of Newcastle County and downstairs there was a desk that was the medical examiner's office and this was my laboratory so that's how I started 
what to do. You know, money was not my objective. I want to do something in my field. So I said, how can you deal with these things? Everybody is against you. The coroners didn't want me. When they had a case, they would go over there, they made their own diagnosis, announce it, and this is in the newspaper. And then later on I found out that is not the diagnosis. So what do you do? There's a real problem here. And number two, they just didn't like medical examiner. There was a, always a conflict between medical examiner and the coroners. As I, as I understood, I tried to figure out something about it. The coroners came, the coroner system came to this country some 600 years ago, five, 600 years ago. And the coroners were a very respected, they had a respected position with the king. If somebody died, they were supposed to get the belonging or whatever they had for the treasury of the king, very respected and supported by the king. And here, of course, the coroners who are the undertakers, they, at that time, you used to call them mortician. Funeral directors now, very nice job, doing wonderful job. But because they deal with the dead body, so they knew more than anyone about what caused the death. That was the thinking. And so, I decided to first do several things before I take care of the coroner system. I became a member of the medical society. There was a national organization at that time, which right now exists, American Academy of Forensic Sciences. I became a member there. And I started to find a way for some help. So what I did, I went to the medical society and said, would you invite the medical examiner of Philadelphia to come here and talk to us here about the medical examiner system? And they invited. And I said, could you invite somebody from General Assembly the lawmakers, and at that time, God bless her soul, Ann Bader, Miss Ann Bader, was the executive director of medical society. And she decided to, uh, to invite the chairman of the Joint Finance Committee, a gentleman by the name of you know, you remember all his name, don't you? <laughs> Senator Steele. And he was such a wonderful state, uh, person to help me. And we had a meeting like this, and the medical examiner from Philadelphia came and talked about the importance of medical examiner system. And after everything was said, he turned around and he said, and I was sitting in the back of the room, he said, could you tell me who is the medical examiner here? So they pointed toward me, and I introduced myself. And he said he was working at the time in the pigment department. He had a good job with the DuPont company, and he was in the pigment department. He said, come to my office. I'll see whether I can help you in some areas about the medical examiner system. And he was very helpful. He was a real gentleman. In fact, a lot of times I went to his house and trying to write down what was correct. So that's how I started here. Now, you noted what was in the paper and I didn't know about the this sport at the time, but the explanation was that I was the loser, no matter what, because, you know, you read it, you know what it means. At the time, I didn't know what it mean, meant. So I look at these things and I said, well, I need, I need some help somewhere. So 
I went to late DNC Steel, Senator Steel, and I said, look, I come here, I want to do something. This is my background. I have to deal with the coroner system, and my budget is very small. I don't know what to do about it. And at that time, I didn't have any laboratory, so when I performed the autopsy, which was done in the funeral home, I had to take the samples for microscopic slides to Baltimore, where I had my training over there at the medical examiner's office. And Dr. Ross Fisher, who was the medical examiner over there, was kind enough to do it for free for us, because in my budget, I didn't have any money to pay for that. And that's how we worked. So, but he was extremely helpful. And I got another notice from news media that this is the last chance. Either I succeed or I have to leave. But in any event, I figured out that we needed three things to do if we were going to establish a system. One, you can't have the so-called funeral directors examining the body and for me to listen to them as they being my boss. So we had to abolish that system because it didn't make any, any sense. And we had to have a nice facility and have enough money to run the office. It's a very simple thing, the three things to accomplish at that time. It wasn't very easy to do so, but that was my thought and my idea. So I had another article in the paper, which was encouraging and saying that, well, after I talked to Senator DNC Steele and others, they decided that, well, maybe it's a good idea for him to leave the funeral home and go somewhere. And uh, so they gave me two bungalows on Kirkwood Highway with a garage in between them. And this was the whole building used for women's prison. Became dilapidated, so they said, this is a good place for medical examiner's office. So I went over there, and uh, I had to do some repairs. So I asked Gen General Assembly for $5,000 to repair the building. <coughs> and you don't believe it, but the, the contractor that renovated one area, one of the buildings, and he charged at that time $7,500 or $8,000. I had to borrow some more money. It was his first, I think, state building, maybe his first building in the state. His name, if I tell you, probably you know, Petanaro. <laughs> his was his first job from me and now he is multi-millionaire, billionaire, whatever he is. Very nice man, very nice job he did for me. But then I had to start my autopsies in this garage. Beautiful autopsy room. And I bought, the, one of the funeral directors wanted to get rid of that table. That, that is for embalming. So they sold it to me for a good price, $50 I paid for my autopsy table. And that's where I was doing my autopsies for a while until we fixed that one of the buildings with Petonaro did it for $8,000. And I bought an autopsy table. But this is a very, I mean, this is a treasure picture because I took this to the General Assembly, to the Joint Finance Committee. It was after lunch. They just had their lunch, and I took this picture over there and presented, and I said, first state of the United States has an autopsy room. 
for the medical examiner. And then very quietly and nicely I opened the zipper and it was a decomposed body. And they all turned red and blue and uh, so Senator Steele was the chairman of the committee and the vice chairman from back there said, Doctor, why are you showing these pictures? I said, I want money. And he said, around to the chairman and said, Mr. Chairman, give it to him and get him out of here. <laughs> so I got the money. That picture, picture, because otherwise, after lunch, showing the decomposed body, how can you get the money? That's the way to do it. So finally, I got the money, I started the autopsy room, I did my work here, and my point was that, is not, first of all, within a short period of time, in one year, the number of homicides that I discovered was almost three times more than the year before. So something was not detected at that time by our coroner system. But my, my, the thing that I had in my mind, I wanted to have a medical examiner system, not just to examine and find out who is guilty of doing something wrong, but to me, administration of justice was the most important thing, not for the dead people, but for the living, for the society. So I raised the issue of abolishing my coroner system. And at that time, the office of coroner was a constitutional office. I'm sure that you all know Constitution is something that you can't just get, it, get rid of it right away. It was, you had to have the passage of both houses and then have another election and then pass the uh, constitutional things for the second time, for the, the second assembly in order to amend the Constitution and get rid of it. I was lucky. We went through the first session, passed, Medical Society helped, Senator Steele helped very much. The second time after the election, it went through, and then we won with one vote in the House, one vote. But fortunately, it was passed, and the coroner's office, first of all, they wanted to bury medical examiner, uh, but then by passage of that, Constitution, we send them to the morgue, and finally the, the coroner system was buried. That was July 1st, 1970. Now something happened in the state because for the first time they decided that we don't need all these commissions, committees, and things. Let's have a uh, cabinet form of governments, and they noted that I was putting the things together a little bit here and there, and now we got rid of the coroner system, and they said, now we are going to have a cabinet. Where do you want to go? Where do you want to be? I said, no, no, no cabinet, no department. I want to be independent, because I always thought that we have, I learned it here in the old country of Iran, we had judges sitting over there making the decision in most countries. But some of the traditions came from England was the jury system here that we have. Twelve jurors sitting over there. They are not judges. They are not doctors. They are not they are just ordinary citizens. They sit down over there. And when you go to court, there are two sides. One side is telling the fact, one side is telling no fact. I don't want to call it lying, okay? So if both sides are telling the truth, why do they go to court? We found out that if you are investigating anything, 
you get to a point that you need a scientific evidence. And that scientific evidence should be independent. Not the part of the prosecutor, not the part of the defense, not the part of the judges. It should be independent. That was my goal, an independent system in the state of Delaware. It was very difficult to do that because first thing that they did, the coroners I abolished, so they sued me. I took their job. I had no right to do so, so I was sued. So we had to defend it. Medical society helped me. In fact, they paid for the lawyer to defend me. Because I didn't have much money at that time, $18,000, $30,000. It wasn't enough to do all these things. So they hired a lawyer and defended me. One of the first things that we did, we want to know how much the income of this funeral home, a Newcastle County funeral director, Warwick his name was, Mr. Warwick, very nice gentleman, but we found out that the year before he became coroner, he had he made only twelve thousand dollars, and when he was coroner, his income doubled. So how how could he lose money? And he's suing me for that. I took his business away. It was very simple. Whenever any sudden death occurred, anywhere, accident, or whatever, he would be the one to go over there to investigate. And the family, that type of situation, they need some help. Don't worry about it. We'll take care of it. OK? So while they're investigating, they're also the funeral director. And that's why. So the judge, that threw away the complaint. So we succeeded from that point of view. And I said, I want to have a department of medical examiner and forensic sciences. They said, oh, you're so small. You know, you can't have a department. You must be a part of a department. How about to be with the Department of Public Safety with the state police, or to be with the Another department like, for instance, Department of Justice with the prosecutors. I said, no, is that a department of beauty? I want to be a part of that. He said, well, tell us something. I said, okay. The closest that we can get is Department of Health and Social Services. And I wrote that portion of the law. And Senator Steele was very kind. He introduced it. And we became, we became a part of the Department of Health and Social Services. It was very nice because everything that we did, a lot of things that we did, had a lot to do with the public health and public safety. And Bill Frank, very, very good reporter and writer, he gradually found out what we were doing, and he became really a supporter. And he knew Dr. Lynch from the postmortem board, and uh, he indicated that Homily will agree that we, News Journal, helped him to put his case through so everybody knows about it. But he doesn't know that Dr. Lynch was also reporting to us what was going on. And in fact, he was right. Dr. Lynch was very helpful because one time we had to go to Washington. And as an ex, they reported first I was a visitor. Came with a visitor visa. No. I came with what, what as, at that time they used to call it exchange visitor, meaning that you come here and you have your training and experience, but you had to leave for two years before you could come back here again. And, but there was a little thing in the law saying that if they needed you here, so then you can change that to a permanent residency, ultimately getting your citizenship. So he was very kind, and the board also, Board of Postmortem Examiner, decided that they will ask one of our senators in Washington, 
to indicate that we need this man and we better make a, an exception so that he could stay here. So one day I got in his car, he was a, uh, a surgeon. He was a general to begin with and he was a surgeon and he drove me with his Cadillac to Washington. At that time, I don't know whether you remember or not, but there was a Baltimore-Washington Parkway. We didn't have I-95, any of these things. And then in the middle, and he had, he had a state police car because he was state police surgeon. And he had his siren and light and everything. So we were late a little bit to get to Washington and see, I think it was Senator, either it was Senator Ross or Senator Boggs that was supposed to introduce this bill. And we were late, so he decided to have his siren and light and everything. And before we knew it, the police was behind us trying to stop us and see what it, this car is doing, this Cadillac is doing. So they stopped us and he said, don't say anything, just sit here. So the police officer got there and saw this general with his uniform and everything, saluted and, uh, and he said, officer, this is our chief medical examiner. He has an appointment in the Senate and we are late. We have to get there as soon as possible. He said, don't worry about it, follow me. So the police officer with his siren moved us and we went to Washington DC. And guess what? He drove right next to the steps that we go to the Senate. Nowadays, you want to go over there, you have to have six blocks all the way, you know, it's restricted. Then we went right there, step, we went up there, met the senator, and he was very kind, introduced three times, they introduced the bill, and finally I got my permanent uh, residency and ultimately, of course, my citizenship. But you remember that? the composed body and they said give it to him and get him out of here. I got the money so I built the building. The medical examiner's office on Adams Street, South Adams Street and very nice building. I designed it. There was one problem. I wanted from the state to give me a piece of land so we could have our parking lot because I, have to, I wanted to have educational system and everything. And I needed some place for the people to park. He said, this is the only area that you have was next to the highway, 95. And also was next, of course, at that time was Route 13 on, you know, 95 it didn't exist at that time. And then they put the bus uh, terminal over there and, and you have all these exhaust system and everything and you have your, uh, your equipment, your laboratory equipment. So I talked to our designer, architect, engineer, and he said, don't worry about it. I'll build a building windowless. That building had no window that you could open it. So we couldn't get, we didn't want to have all these things to come in and somehow interfere with our equipment that we have in our laboratory. Dr. Daskufta is sitting here and he knows he was our chief toxicologist, he knows what I'm talking about. But in any event, we still have the bus terminal over there and we have the medical examiner's building. So it was Office of Chief Medical Examiner, Forensic Sciences Laboratory. We didn't have any. When I came here, there was only one agricultural chemist in the agriculture department and he was doing the alcohol, blood alcohol test for the police. <clears throat> so I had to build all these things, not only blood alcohol, but we had all kinds of other testing that we had to do. So I dedicated the building at that time. This was Governor Peterson came for the dedication ceremony in 1972. Remember 1964 I came here? And now with all the problems that we had, we were able, that garage did it, that decomposed body did it, and we built this building, and now it's dedicated. And Dr. Begans was at that time the secretary of the department, and, uh, and also uh, Dr. Ingram 
became, he, he was the secretary of Department of Health and Social Services. So that's how the building was dedicated. And you remember Dr. Lynch with everything that he did to help me, I dedicated our conference room to Dr. Lynch. That's Governor Peterson dedicating that in the memory at that time, unfortunately, Dr. Lynch uh, was deceased, but we dedicated the conference room to Dr. Uh, and of course, by that time, unfortunately, Senator Steele, who helped so much, and God bless his soul, he had uh, cerebral hemorrhage and he couldn't walk, so uh, there was a dedication ceremony for him. I wanted to dedicate the laboratory to Senator Steele. And Governor Dupont sitting over there, I asked if his honor would uh, come and dedicate the building to Senator Steele, which he did. And this is the process of dedicating that. Steele, Senator Steele is sitting there. Both of them are cutting the ribbon behind uh, Senator Steele and behind him is his wife, and behind this uh, old man at that time. Incidentally, when I came here and when I went to the General Assembly and asking for money, a lieutenant from the state police said to the members of the Joint Finance Committee that we don't need any laboratory here. We have the FBI, they do everything for free. They come here and they testify for free. If you need, if you have money, give it to us because we need a hel helicopter. We don't have a helicopter, so give us the money for that. We don't need the laboratory. So that's how I had to start to do the work. Whether you have helicopter or you have a laboratory to do the work. But in any event, this was dedicated to him. And this is what I wrote at that time as mission of Office of Medical Examiner within the Department of Health and Social Services. Finding the murder, the murderer is not the only mission that I wanted for the office. Everything was for the living, for the welfare of the living. The man is dead, is gone. Okay, you find someone who did commit that, but the medical examiner's office should do more than that. We wanted to recognize the hazard to the public health and public safety. We want to know the problem with the industrial things. We want to know who is the innocent person to be exonerated. That's more important. And on top of that, we want to have an impartial system not belonging to the police and prosecutor. At least that was my thought. And then later on, I found out that that's not what they wanted. But I got involved with some other things. In, in between these areas, I. I became a member of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences. I went to New York City. They had a good medical examiner system. Dr. Halpern was the chief medical examiner. He heard me and I said, Dr. Halpern, there is no standard in this country. There is nowhere that you can go and say what is right and what is wrong to do in the medical examiner, medical legal investigative system. He said, you're right because the chairman of the United States counties, and we have hundreds of counties throughout the United States. He wanted to have also an organization. So guess what? He and I and a few other medical examiners got together, four or five of them, and we started an organization called National Association of Medical Examiners. So if anyone would like to blame me, I'm the one that I went over there asking for help. So we started National Association of Medical Examiners. And the things that I started here, the first thing I was interested in, mental retardation of the children. So I sent 
people to take some samples from children in the city of Wilmington that they were chewing in their house, the window sills with the old paint. And we didn't have any money, so we got some federal money and we got a piece of equipment that the Daskupta is sitting here. And we started testing their blood, city of Wilmington children, chewing the window sills. And we found, we found some problem there in their blood, lead in their system, which causes mental retardation in children. I reported that to the federal government, and guess what? Five years, this was 1968. 1972, 73, federal government put a ban on the companies that make the paint, and they said, you can't have lead in your paint. That's how it started. And I was very, very much involved in other area education. We had the cigarette smoking. I remember very well when I was uh, a resident at the University of Maryland doing the pathology. There was a professor in New York. He investigated smoking and noted some changes in the respiratory system. And he said that this, this may cause cancer. At that time, we were not sure. So what happened? When he came over there, one person to come and taught, teach us about that, 10 lawyers came from different companies that they make the cigarettes. At that time was Camel and, you know, you, you remember the name. I don't smoke, so there were a lot of names at that time. They all came and opposed. They said, you are wrong. You don't know what you're talking about. Five years later, the Surgeon General of the United States order that on each pocket of the cigarette they should put that, that's dangerous to your health. So you can see how the things gradually developed. But in any event, I was trying to do something here. So remember that at that time, on the highways, up to 150 milligrams, somebody, some of these scientists at that time, they didn't do a good job. They said 0.15 gram percent. You go to court and these jurors sitting over there, they don't know anything about that, but they know what is 150, they know what is 100, they know what is 50. So in this country at that time, 150 milligrams, you had to reach that level of alcohol in order to be inconsistent with your driving. 150 milligrams. European country especially the Scandinavian country had 50 milligrams. And beyond that, you, you go out, you drink as much as you want, but you have one person in your car driving who is not drinking at all. I tried here to lower it to 100. I got clubbered by everyone, including at that time the, the attorney general of the state, I won't tell you your name, his name, he came, he opposed it. And his excuse was, he was telling me, doctor, if I have my dinner and I have a couple of drinks, and then they call me and I have to go somewhere because there is a problem. I don't want to be arrested over there because I said, no, 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 no. Dinner and two drinks, you will never get to 100. So finally they passed it. It took a long time, I could lower it to 80 milligrams, 0 0.08. My shoes are falling apart. In any event, we lowered it because state of Connecticut lowered it to 0 0.08, so 80 milligrams, and we lowered it to that. So you can see that I didn't figure out the medical examiner's office is only to determine the cause of death. We could do a lot more than that for the living. I also, you know that it was because of the work that the medical examiners did that we changed all the security system, all the safety system in the vehicles. Go back to the old vehicles, all the handles, anything in the dashboard, everything that was protruding when there was an accident a lot of injuries 
correlated to those things within the vehicle. And we reported all these things, the medical examiners to the manufacturers. Today, the car is much more secure and safe as opposed to 50, 60 years ago because of the work that the medical examiners have done, because of the work that we decided that we do for the welfare and safety of the living. The dead person is gone, but you have to do for the living. So I was honored to, give a, to get a, uh, some sort of recognition by a, a committee of 39. I don't know whether it's still we have that committee or not. I have no idea. But they were very kind to give me a recognition that I was doing some job here. And incidentally, since we had that National Association Medical Examiner we established, it was, I have some publication here. I left it on that table. I don't know whether it was collected or not by someone. But in any event, uh, they decided to give me some positions first. I was a secretary. The office of National Association of Medical Examiner was here in Delaware. We didn't have any money for that organization as for, at first. I bought a mimeograph machine. And in my basement, I was producing all the announcement and everything. And I had a secretary at that time. Unfortunately, she passed away just recently. She was very helpful. And that secretary helped for publication throughout the country. When we had our annual meeting, it was only $10 to participate, including the lunch and breakfast. So it was a good day at that time. Now I think they charge four or five hundred dollars. But in any event, so then later on, they decided that, well, we should be vice president. And then they elect me as president of the organization. But the, the center and the office of National Association Medical Examiner was here in Delaware, in Wilmington. South Adams Street. So, you know, for, from the old days of the coroner system and then coming to national recognition, I felt always was good for the medical society, was good for the safety and health of the people in the state of Delaware. Well, here it is, the announcement here. And uh, uh, I was very proud of it, not because our office, but because the state of Delaware was now recognized nationally as being the center of this movement. And here is the first thing that I did. I said, we don't have any standard for the medical examiner. So I established a committee for standards for the medical examiner system throughout the country. And I left something over there. but. You see the address is South Adams Street, and this is the standard that we established that if you are, and we were inspecting these places, whether or not they're living with the standards that the medical examiner system should have. It started here in Delaware, and I was very proud of it. And this is Dr. Halpern, the chief medical examiner of New York, that he and I and a couple of other medical examiners decided to establish the organization. He was a very kind and very, very knowledgeable person. And then the newspaper announced that 1972 was a good year for me because not only we had a new building, we had a new med medical examiner system, but also among other, among 66 others, I became the citizen of the United States of America. So they announced that I had, 1972, I had everything that one could ask for it. And I was very, very thankful that finally I could, quote, stay here. Then I said, well, our building is not good enough for everything. So we decided at that time to expand that. And that expansion, again got into a lot of troubles. Let me share something with you, some, because I want you really 
to remember, I'm not here to criticize anyone. I'm not here to say something is bad or good. I'm not running for any office. I love everyone. I respect everyone. And when I say something is wrong, because I think from the standpoint of the welfare and safety and health of the public, whether I'm here or not, it doesn't make any difference. But I thought that the system has to be independent. And we have to have a full system of forensic laboratory. When I went before the General Assembly, you remember that you remember that lieutenant said that we need the helicopter, we don't need the laboratory here. He also I learned later on from Chief William Brawley, who's sitting here, he was telling, he was calling me as a camel driver. Well, no problem. He didn't, he didn't learn his geography and history in the high school. He didn't know that Iran was, you know, we, don't, we, were, not, we were not driving camel. I can tell you, I can assure you, I never drove a camel. <laughs> never. It was very nice to drive a camel. Still, I want to do it, of course, at my age, 86. It's difficult, but in any event. Uh, the best artists that we have in this country, they drove in their films, they drove camel. But I heard then, Senator Steele was telling me, the chairman of the, or the Senate president of the state of Delaware, in their meetings, he used to call me, not as the medical examiner, not as homily, he used to call me the, that camel driver, is trying to shorten our election ticket because the coroner's office was at the bottom of the ticket and I shortened that ticket. I was the guilty one. So I was the camel driver. What else do you expect? That's what I had to. So when I started this project, I want to have a complete comprehensive forensic sciences laboratory to do everything that was necessary for everyone within the state. And every problem that you think that they put ahead of me, in front of me. First of all, I learned, and I learned from Chief Riley sitting here, the state police, very nice organization, they're the best. They say they're the best. And I have no reason to say now, not the best. In the whole country, forget about Delaware. They decided to give a state police car to my chief toxicologist, working for me in my office, in my laboratory. They gave a state police car to him with the telephone and maybe the light and everything. He was running around throughout the state giving the talk that the medical examiner's office and this forensic laboratory should be a part of the state police, not to be a part of the Department of Health and Social Services. State police is the one that should have the laboratory. And they are the one that they want a helicopter. They didn't want to have anything because everything was done by, by FBI. But in any event, it took 10 years with all kinds of obstruction, all kinds of problems for me finally to get the rest of the building here. But let me go through this very, very fast. They killed it so many times, and I tried to revive it any way that I wanted. I had a lot of help. And finally, they brought all kinds of experts from all over the country. And they brought someone, Cadman, from California. and wrote a, a lot of report, but you can see in four lines what he's saying, supporting Buddha. They brought every expert that they could find, and they all supported the concept of having an independent forensic sciences laboratory here. And I went to FBI, and I said, these people said we don't need the laboratory, and you are doing everything for free. They said, no, no, no. We only can do it for federal 
government organizations. We don't have enough help here to do for the local people should do their own work. And I was guilty for one thing over there at VI. I really created the concept in their mind that they should have, they should have, let me see whether I can get to that point. Let me show you this area that was a resolution by all this, uh, all the uh, experts that come here. They all figured out that we needed a forensic laboratory here in the state of Delaware. We cannot depend on FBI. And I went very fast. Finally, the thing that I felt that they killed it, Bill Frank said that no, it was being revived. And there are a lot of things that I don't want to take any more time, your time. And finally, FBI decided to have a one-week course for various states organizations to come, laboratories to come, and to teach them how to develop their forensic laboratory, which I already had developed here. And I participated in that. We spent four or five days over there. And so it was, again, another point that the federal government, FBI, didn't want the laboratory, to, the laboratory work to be done there. And the state police and others here were trying to say that we do it over there for free. The other thing that they did, uh, the state police, and I'm saying these things not as a part of criticism, but facts. Everything that I'm saying is in court documents, is written, and everything documented. I have nothing. Nothing that I'm saying, I don't have a background documented evidence. But what they did, finally, because I was opposing for the police departments having this laboratory, they sent the wife of one of the state troopers, who was a chemist. She came and became, and we didn't know at the time, a member of our laboratory. She spent one year over there, and Dr. Daskupta knows about it. And she developed the knowledge how to do the blood alcohol. And then she left the office and became the director of crime laboratory of the state of Delaware. So that's how that laboratory developed. But in any event, again, because of all these things, I said, look, if you want me, I, I, can, I can resign tomorrow. Have everything that you want. And they said, no, doctor, stay here, and this and that. But finally, Bill Frank wrote an article. He said that he was watching one of the episodes of a show on TV called, you know what it was called at the time? Quincy. 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 Quincy show had a bad show that put the medical examiner investigation and character in a very bad situation. He wrote an article uh, making fun of that. So I said, don't worry about it. We invited Quincy to our national meeting. So I met the Jack Klugman at that time. And also, my wife was there, too, so we both met him. And I asked him, I said, one of our writers here in Delaware is very upset with the way that you are presenting the medical examiners in some fashion that is not really helpful. And he said, my brother is my writer. Why don't you talk to him? And if he has some ideas, just tell him about it. And I talked to his brother, and I told him what is our concern. And guess what? The next few shows, they indicated that the medical examiner's office should be independent and not the part of the police and prosecutor. I watched those episodes, and it was very helpful. So finally, finally, we got the laboratory, and something else happened. They wanted to have, they found a grave in Brazil, Sao Paulo, Brazil. And they thought that this was uh, 
the person that they were looking after for many, many years, he, had, he was at the Auschwitz and he was actually involved in killing a lot of people over there and doing some research in children's eyes. And uh, they looked around and they looked at the national organization, they looked at the American Academy of Forensic Sciences, uh, and I was vice president of that organization. And they said, here's a fellow, maybe he can help. So I was appointed by U.S. Department of Justice to go to Sao Paulo. And we had a committee of three. And uh, we went over there and identified Mengele, Joseph Mengele, and became a, an international case. And I was very happy that the state of Delaware was involved. The Medical Society of Delaware was involved there. I mean, being known now all over the country, state of Delaware, I think, I thought that was a plus. So I will talk about this in detail in October. If you are not on vacation or you have the time, I'll be very happy to give some background. This is a very nice, we didn't have at that time, we didn't have DNA. It was not available. We didn't have his, this man's, Joseph Mengele's dentist. So I had to go with some little information in order to make the identification. That identification was done here. I had my... Uh, uh, committee members coming to Delaware. We had a meeting here for two, three days in my office. See that background over there is my, my old office. And the people here, three of them were in my committee. The three of them, I will explain these things, were from Simon Wiesenthal Center. And I told them to be a part of our committee, write the whole thing together. And I sent them, of course, they, oh, I went too fast, maybe. I don't know what I did. I did something wrong. But in any event, I wrote the report in Delaware, South Adams Street, for an international case, identification of Joseph Mengele. And I thought that was a plus for the state of Delaware, for the Medical Society of Delaware. They wanted to get rid of me, as simple as that. State police wanted to have the laboratory. Maybe they were right. They were right. State police, the best in the country, they want to have the laboratory. They already have their crime laboratory. That, that lady uh, chemist already establishes, so why not? And so they wanted to have, among other things that they did, an excuse to establish that. Well. Unfortunately, from my point of view, we had an assistant medical examiner. A lady came here and said, "Want well, I have to position. And I didn't look at the background. I was so busy with my work and also the work that we are doing nationally. So I hired her. And the whole problem started with an excuse for the government of the state of Delaware and also the state police. I told you about that chief toxicologist when he resigned because we found out the situation. Another friend he had in my laboratory, there was a fire in the laboratory at 2 o'clock in the morning. I can't say for sure, but I think maybe there was some, some sort of a relationship over there. That chemist left too. And so this lady, at one time, this lady, assistant medical examiner, she was on call one weekend. And there was a body, a death. The family already donated the heart and some other organs for the living people. 
they couldn't find her while she was on call the whole weekend. They called her on a cell phone at home, my investigator. They couldn't find her. So by late Sunday afternoon, they called me and they said, what can we do? I said, well, save the living. So the, the crew that they had to come and, and harvest the organ, they came and did. This lady, assistant medical examiner, came Monday morning and used a very, very foul language. And in fact, our chief toxicologist here sitting, I think he knew about it and he wrote the memo and just saying that she didn't do anything wrong. Why, what a right I had to give the permission to give the organs for transplant. In any event, and then she went and talked to the sec two secretaries over there. So they con conspired something against me, that I was a very hard-headed head of agency. I was the very, one of the first things that she said, she said that I had no respect for ladies. No respect whatsoever. Well, the evidence was there that as a lady, I accepted her as my assistant. Number two, perhaps somebody corrects me here. I was the first one when I was president of the medical society. I nominated a lady from our group to become the president of the medical society. And thereafter, some other ladies became president of our medical society. When I was president of the National Association of Medical Examiner, I nominated a lady, as a lady medical examiner to become the president of the National Association of Medical Examiner. I mean, the type of excuses that didn't make any sense. And then we had those two secretaries, one of them having did all kinds of excuses, nonsense, that later on they found out was incorrect. They asked her, the judge asked her, we had a hearing. The judge asked her that, why didn't you say anything before? Oh, I couldn't say anything because had I said anything, Hamali would have come and killed my family. Hamali would come and kill my family. At least he would have kidnapped my son if I said something against him. That's the serious, of course. And then there was another secretary that came to my office. She came with a very high recommendation. She can type 120 words a minute, which I think is impossible. I don't know. 100 words, shorthand dictation, high. And then she said that one time she came to my office, she was crying that she didn't have any money for children to buy the books. So I gave her a $100 bill. And that became an evidence that I was sexually harassing her. All right? Later on, when we went through the court system and the hearing, it became known that this lady that came with the high recommendation. She couldn't even type from one page to the next page the wording that the state had against that assistant medical examiner suspending her without pay. She couldn't even type that on my stationery for a whole day. Six different versions, she couldn't type it. And also, guess what, who was the former boss that wrote such a beautiful recommendation was her boyfriend. And the state used all these evidence against me. I'm a hard-headed man. I don't give any. I have no respect for my employees over there. So they terminated my 10-year appointment. I had twice before the third one was the third one was in 1990 
And these are the type of things that I had to get through. Now, you may say that this man is crazy staying here, but that was my whole life. I want to have independent forensic sciences laboratory. In any event, I just wanted to let you know that the judge ordered, and please read this part of it, the judge was supposed to make a decision, the hearing judge was supposed to make a decision that whether or not the state of Delaware has shown any cause to terminate my appointment. That was the order of the court. The, I had to file a suit in the federal court, not the state court here, federal court. And both sides decided that any decision would be non-appealable. We all signed, the state signed, I signed it, the judge signed it. When we, the hearing was over, the judge decided that the state had no right to terminate my contract. Now, the Attorney General's office said, wait a minute. That decision, although we put it in writing, but was not force enforceable because it was a recommendation. The secretary of the department makes the decision. Now someone that I sued in court now is going to make a decision whether or not my contract should be. Finally, after all these things, and I've taken so much of your time to tell you what we had to go through in order to do something for the administration of justice. I said, in fact, after that hearing, and one of my gentlemen friend is not here, they offered me a million dollars to leave with one condition. I can't go back to the office. I said, no, I want to go back to the office. They'll give me a million dollars. I said, money is not important for me. So, after going through all these things and all the insult, I decided that maybe it's the time to leave. When I was an, a resident in, Do in uh, Baltimore, there was a gentleman by the name of Sylvan Passon sitting next to me in the cubicle as a resident. That he said, let's have a private laboratory in Maryland. At that time, Maryland didn't have a private laboratory. He said, let's open a private laboratory in Maryland. I said, no, 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 I want to be a medical examiner. He went and opened it, and he sold it to a national laboratory that we all know for $50 million. Did I make a mistake? No, this is what I wanted. But in any event, finally I said, okay. In 1997, 1994, they eliminated my contract, they tore it apart. But 1997, they said, okay, I'm retiring right now. They gave me my back pay and everything. And so there were all kinds of things was in the, in the paper. I'm not going to take your time, but they all found out that everything that they were saying was totally and called for big mistake. They wasted. They told me for three years to sit at home, we'll pay you, but you are not allowed to come back to the office. I mean, does it make any sense? So they put someone over there as now chief medical examiner who came to my office, stayed for one year, left because a hospital was paying three times as much. So that was the interest that this individual had. And while was working, was, while, when I retired and I was in court with the state of Delaware, they put him as chief medical examiner over there. And what he did, he was working in Rhode Island as opposed to the state of Delaware. He destroyed the office. They had drug problems. They couldn't do it. Dr. Daskupto is sitting here. When he was in that office, as
the combination to our drug analysis laboratory area. And I even didn't have, I didn't want to have the combination. This gentleman, this other new medical examiner, hired someone who was convicted somewhere else for stealing. He had the combination to the drug area, so the drugs were sold outside and they were missing. Four or five hundred cases that went through the court, they were all being challenged in the court here. Very soon, of course, they decided that they had to get rid of that situation, but in any event, I just wanted to let you know that in the state of Delaware, the medical examiner's office was under the Department of Health and Social Services. On the other side of the state, country, county of Los Angeles, the, it was a department of medical examiner. So you could have a department for a county, although that county had as many population as we have here. And then, of course, now we have Department of Homeland Department of Public Safety, which is basically state police, and Homeland Security. I don't know what we have with the Homeland Security, but in any event, that's what we have right now. And one other thing I mentioned to let you know that one of the, one of the uh, <coughs> officials of the state, in answer to a letter that came to him, and I didn't want that name, of course, somehow got in, that name of the person. But he said that while we are in court hearing for me, we wanted to save the name. Respect to Ali Homily and these ladies, we don't publish any name. Guess what? Two weeks before this letter, they were all over the country, state of Pennsylvania, state of New Jersey, state of Maryland, all over here in the state of Delaware. Newspapers are writing about all these things. Also, this gentleman indicated that they offered me a hearing and I refused it. I had to go to the federal court to get a hearing. I mean, this, I wouldn't say this is a lie, this is a mistake, okay? Well, turn out that later on, I mean, this is not the way that I put the slides together, but it came that way. That official was the state governor. I think, I mean, let's, let's give the benefit of that. Some of the workers in the office just forged his signature. It was not his opinion, because no governor would lie. Somebody forced his signature. But this is what happened in the state of Delaware. State police was after it. Somebody in the attorney general's office helped. And somebody in the governor's office helped to get rid of me and destroy the office that I put together, the laboratory to get together. This is the triangle that, in my opinion, is what happened. For, for, I think this is the end of the slides. I just want to mention a couple of things in closing then. I appreciate your time that you listened to me, because I thought that you as physicians and good citizens of the state, you should know about what is happening in the state. Why are we doing it? Then I came to one conclusion. There was another slide that I don't know how to do it, but it was about DNA. I don't have it here. But in my opinion, none of these people are wrong. Because this is in our DNA. And the DNA didn't come only within this earth that somebody 400 years ago was flat. It was known to be flat. And he said, no, it's not flat, it's wrong. They killed him. Okay. I think our DNA comes from all over the universe. And maybe we have thousands and thousands of universes. This is one of them. And these DNAs came from all over these areas. No two people are the same. No two people are thinking the same. And happened that some people, they lie and they think that that is the way to run your business. 
Lying can make them go up to highest position in the country, in the world. Having the power, I came also to the conclusion that if you have the money, you can do anything that you want. Money buys anything and everything. Money buys governorship. Money buys senatorship. Money buys presidency. My money buys all kinds of ship. Big ship. You can buy money with big ship. So it's money. If you have the money, you have the power. If you have the power, you can govern. If you have the power, you can order. So, and is our DNA, we can't help it. That's the way that happens. And so why being upset about it? And when you lie, which our secretaries lied, each one got $70,000 before to go to the hearing. When I filed a complaint, they got $70,000 each as a witness to come and testify. If I paid $70 to someone to come to court and testify, they put me in jail. State government, attorney general's office, paid $70,000, your tax money and my tax money. They expunged the lies and the suspension of that assistant medical examiner, expunged, expunged the, the record because she came and testified on their behalf. So this is the system. I'm not at all, I'm not at all complaining about it. This is in our DNA, that's it. So I thank you for your time. I tried my best. But I lost. That's the way that it is.